Hello, everyone. So welcome to lunchtime live chat for backyard beginner beekeepers. So I'm down here in my YouTube bungalow. It's Sunday afternoon. Today is December the 15th. It's freezing cold outside. It's going down into the teens and the wind gusts are going up to 35 miles an hour. So of course, this afternoon, I'm doing baby portraits. But for right now, I'm here talking about beginner beekeeping. And if you chime in and you have questions, this is the place to post them. So if you're watching this after the fact, look down in the comment section below. This is gonna run about an hour. And if you missed it, just go ahead and put your questions down below because we're gonna do another question and answer session, which will not be live this following Friday. So people are starting to show up now. Great, thanks for seeing everyone. Good afternoon from Annapolis, John. Nathan. Some people don't like it when I spend a lot of time doing shout outs to people that are showing up in this uh, down here in the comment section based on how you're seeing it. John McNeil. Good day. Hello, everybody. Larry Lee. Great to see everyone. And uh, let me know what's going on. When you ask a question, also let me know where you're located, what's going on with you. So we'll just talk about anything that pops up. And one of the good aspects of having a live chat like this, some people don't wanna dig through all of the series on beginner beekeeping because we've done 42 episodes of that uh, to know if I've covered something or not. So whatever's on your mind right now, uh, this is your opportunity to ask the question and get some just in time, we call it, uh, information. Hug a bee, all the same people that we see I'm glad you all made it. Now, people should have known that this was coming up, and I want to appreciate, uh, pass my appreciation on to those of you who answered my survey about when you wanted the live chat, Sunday afternoon, and uh, whether you wanted it combined with answers uh, to questions that are received first. No, they want a straight live chat, and we separated the two, so we did another one yesterday. Well, yesterday we did a walk through the woods, snowy walk through the woods, Larry. Yep, Washington. And of course, a lot of the people that are down here in the chat stream know each other. And that's one of the good aspects of a live chat. People can touch base, uh, make friends, reconnect, ask each other questions. And of course, this dialogue carries on in the comment section after it's done. So after the live session, this will remain. So time to get your kids, neighbor kids to build snow walls around your hives. Snow walls around the highs. Anything that provides a windbreak would be good. We're going to have gusty winds this afternoon. And uh, I appreciate that you all are here. We have 25 people uh, that are chiming in. Anyone has a question or something to share, we can talk about it. So, oh yeah, and uh, this is my latest coffee cup design. And this is the Honey Bee Guru. And you might wonder, what does it say on there? Well... It says, I have been to the apiary, and after many seasons, I have returned knowing the way to be. So the way to be is the name of my bee vlog. So those are underneath, too, in the uh, offerings there with the T-shirts and everything. Video looks 100% today. Thank you, because you know what? I completely reconfigured my system yesterday and moved my antennas around until I got the uh, best signal quality I could get. If the signal starts to degrade, I hope somebody says something over in the comments chat section so that uh, I'll shut down the chat. I do not want evidence forever on YouTube of a crappy pixelated image. If we were bees, that's the way we would see the world, but we're not. So time to get your kids. So somebody is putting snow walls around their hives and uh, nobody has a question. Decent size cup. It's, it's 11 ounces, if anybody wants to know. By the way, I drew that bee. Just in case you wondered, it was a pencil sketch. And the new ones have the beehive on them. That's a pen and ink. So you want to look at those too. Going to get snow tomorrow, Logan, Ohio. And, uh, oh yeah, what kind of coffee am I drinking? Cafe Arosto. That is from one of my viewers that actually owns his own coffee roasting business. Fantastic. Sean McNell, hello. 
Robert Geckel, hey, how's it going? And uh, we will have another chat before Christmas. You know it, Mark. There will be another one. I don't know when. But I'm getting caught up with my work, which means I have more time to spend making videos. And wouldn't you know it, that comes around at the time of year when we have snow everywhere. So if you looked at my snowy walk yesterday, you know what the environment's like. So it figures that I get the time to do things when there's nothing going on outside. Been experimenting, here's our Philly. Been experimenting with making pepper infused honey. Any suggestions on how to thicken it back up after the infusion? No, I have no, I have no idea. If you're infusing peppers with honey, I'm guessing that this is honey that you're going to eat. You can always reduce the water content in your honey by uh, using a regular household dehumidifier. Put it in the smallest room you have, open the container, run the dehumidifier, and you will see it go right on down. And uh, what else we have? Brazil. Welcome. Here we go. World gets smaller through YouTube. When do you connect with Cedar at Flow? When do I connect with Cedar? How do you mean that? Um, I've talked with Cedar. I've talked with uh, We Skype. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I have been invited by the Flow Hive people to take part in their online beekeeping instruction website, which is called thebeekeeper.org. And I'm one of the instructors. So they reached out to me and uh, invited me to be a part of that uh, teaching group. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I did a basic lesson. And you can see some of those lessons for free right now. And I did the one about uh, how to put together a basic beehive. So I was really excited that they contacted me. And thanks to the magic of the internet, we can do all of this uh, all over the world. But that is actually thebeekeeper.org is run by the inventors of the Flow Hive. And uh, so I mean, good day from Canada. I saw one of your videos about biofloor for Hive. How did your experiment go? I don't know what a biofloor is. Stephanie, Stephane, Stephanie. Saw a video about the biofloor for Hive. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I don't know what a biofloor is. Is there another way to explain that? Um, Northern Illinois. Hello, so everybody's here, but since nobody's really asking a question, although I'd like to know what this biofloor for Hive is. And again, we have people chiming in from Greece. Thank you for joining us. 32 people watching. There's one thing that did come in that I'm going to be looking at. Anyone know what this is? If you know what this is, write your answer in the comment section. Let's see. Good morning from Minnesota. This year I was wondering why the honey crystallized so fast. It's not when honey crystallizes in a jar, it is not uh, doesn't have anything to do with the air. It has to do with the nectar source and how much pollen and stuff is in it. So oftentimes, so what's crystallized honey? I'll give an example right here. Both of these Honey sources were drawn off of the hives at exactly the same time. They've been in the jars for exactly the same amount of time. What's the difference? The floral source. These bees must have been working the asters and the goldenrod more, and these were probably working the clover and some of the other nectar sources that do not crystallize because they don't filter it, and because they don't remove the particulates out of it, we end up with crystallized honey if the source is prone to crystallization. Is one honey better than the other? Nope. This just stays liquid. This can be reliquified later. But look at that. The exact same times, it's a matter of the source that the bees use. So different colonies are going after different things. But it doesn't have to do with the year or the season in particular. It's the floral source and what's predominant 
for that uh, time of year. JP the B man, I have Permacom as well to test. Yeah, I just got mine two days ago. They sent me a whole box of it. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, John says very wide foundation. I can tell you, John, with the foundation, if we're talking about this, Permacomb, by the way, is completely drawn, solid food grade wax. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about the size of these uh, cells. These are coming in at 5.1 millimeters. And that is, of course, on the surface. If you go deeper in, because this is obviously a drawn out material, they're narrower at the bottom. So it goes all the way down to 4.8 at the bottom of the cell. And they are slanted, just like the bees would do. And uh, so, yeah, all the way deep inside, running around 4.9 millimeters. And at the very opening, 5 to 5.1 millimeters. I measured that this morning, just in case that question came up. Biofloor, check out Phil Chandler, Barefoot Beekeeper, UK. Okay, so there's Biofloor. See, I've never talked about Biofloor, so I don't know what that is. Your friend, what's your recipe for honey butter, you know, to use up crystallized honey? I don't do anything to it. I just take it out as crystallized honey, and I don't alter it at all. It remelts when you put it on hot toast and other hot uh, breads and things like that. Or when you put it in coffee, it just melts right up again, so I don't actually change it. I take it right out of the hive, put it right in the jar. If it crystallizes, it gets uh, used just the way it is. I don't alter it. And uh, yes, you belong with the best. Glad the Flow Company is crediting your teaching skills. Thanks. Yeah, Esther, you know, I was really surprised that they asked me because there's a whole string of PhDs in their uh, instructor list of professionals. Uh, so I'm right down there with basically I'm from the University of Direct Experience when it comes to beekeeping. And I was very happy to get uh, that email that they were inviting me to take part. So we'll see how that goes. Very excited to be in that group. Uh, JP the B-Man, depending on how you use them, you need to place them three eighths inch apart each side. So JP the B-Man, are you talking about the spacing of those frames when you put them in the box? It's interesting that you mentioned that because guess what comes with the permacomb? These spacers. Look at the difference. If you're putting 10 frames in a 10 frame box, this is the side that's going to be up, and there are 10 slots here. See how close they are? But you flip it over. Now you put nine frames in a 10 frame box. And what's that do? That leaves more space in between because let me tell you something. When it comes to this permacomb stuff, you don't want to be scraping this plastic when you're scraping off your cappings. So by having it in the wider spacing option right there, you will have more space between, which means the bees will draw out their own comb farther and it will stand proud of the surface of it. And then when you scrape it off with your uncapper, whatever you use, you will not be physically interacting with the surface of this plastic, which I highly recommend you don't scrape this plastic. So I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm glad that I just happen to have the spacer handy. These come with the permacomb units. So you can put them in there, and they take the guesswork out of spacing them out. And again, that's for your honey super when you space them out like that. When it comes to brood, it won't make a difference. <coughs> so JP, the B-man, says, did you get the spacers? You know it. I'm way ahead of you people, by the way. Jeremy Lindsay. I'm really happy with my Flow Hive 2 7 frame, just too expensive to have 10 of them. Yeah, if you're buying 10 of them, they're very expensive. By the way, they're offering a $100 discount on their website right now, I think, through the holidays. I can give you a, a $50 discount at any time. But yeah, they're expensive. You buy a pile of them. I think I have 12 Flow Hives, so let's not even talk about cost. Uh, there's one sitting right back here that's not even in service. Okay, that's an eight hundred dollar hive. So that's the biggest complaint about flow hives. I would say if people are angry about them, the biggest source of their anger is the fact that it costs a pile of money. Here's Elizabeth. I closed my upper entrances to have two inch foam board in the inner cover. What are your thoughts? I'm in Michigan. Yes, close your upper entrance. I totally agree. Uh, for all of my beehives this winter, all of the upper entrances are closed. The only opening is at the landing board, and those that have screen bottom boards have the inserted core flute all the way to its top, most restrictive setting. 
So as long as they have inch and a half to two inches of open entrance there on the landing board, I think you're good to go. And yes, we're closing off all the upper entrances on mine here for my climate. And I from Singapore, sorry, I was sure it was you who made the video on it, Biofloor. Yeah, I've not done anything with Biofloors because again, I'm just ignorant about it. I don't know even what they are. So when you put mosses and wood debris to mimic a tree trunk, some say the biodiversity. Now that does sound like what you would find if you looked into a bee tree and uh, you saw all the pulpy debris and dead bees and everything else are in the bottom and all the organisms, by the way, they're feeding on that down there. That sounds like a very holistic approach because you would have a lot of activity, bacteria that's beneficial inside that hive. It's just something I have uh, not looked into, but I know when you're looking at feral colonies and where they live and how they live unattended to by people, you find that there's a lot of debris down there and there's a lot of uh, beneficial bacteria that a lot of beekeepers that over treat kill off the beneficial with the bad bacteria. So it's a very interesting area. Uh, it creates as a plus against Varroa. I can't you know, attest to whether it is a bonus against Varroa, but I will say this, if your bees are healthier, if the environment that they're in keeps them healthier and stronger, just like people, even though you're on cold germs and so on, you are less likely to be sick. Healthier bees do not succumb to illness as quickly. So if you've got some natural bacteria that benefits the bees, I can see where that would help. I saw a very little traffic and a couple of hives opened one. It was 55 degrees. I saw about three frame cluster. Is that about the right size for an eight frame? So if you've got three frames of bees clustered in an eight frame box and you're confining them to the deep, this is from Backyard Bees in North Carolina. I have uh, had single eights with three or four frames, just as you're describing, make it all the way through winter, just fine. I hope that a lot of those frames are uh, full of honey and that they have some resources to get them through. If not, you're gonna have to do something to feed them, but mine made it just fine. Fewer bees uh, actually have consumption of fewer resources, so they actually can get by on much less. That's a good wintering cluster potentially. Uh, keep good records. What is your temp there? We're having 50 degrees sunny weather here in Andridge, Tennessee. I tell you right now, it's 29 degrees and it's going to drop into the teens this afternoon. Uh, glad I made it. Mark Sipes, after seeing what you did with crystallized honey, what can be done to non crystallized honey to make it non flowing for emergency feeding? Um, I don't know. <laughs> When it, he's asking, if you're going to use this for emergency feed, if you're going to use straight honey, by the way, that's the best stuff. But if you're going to use it for emergency feeding, you can't put this in a rapid round, for example, because the bees will get down in there, they get stuck in it, and they just die. So you have a pile of dead bees in your honey. If you're going to use this and put it upside down on one of those upside down feeders, you're going to have the same expansion and contraction when those warm days come along, and it's going to push it out through these little holes. But I think the bees can manage uh, honey better if you're putting this in an upside down feeder and feeding it that way than if it were sugar syrup, which you should not put on in the wintertime anyway. But I think they might keep up with uh, the honey that seeps out of that because when is it going to expand when they have a warm up? So when it gets over 50 degrees, they're going to break cluster, they're going to move around, they might keep up with that. So I don't do anything to slow it down. If you've got it at 16% moisture, for example, so if you've got thicker honey, I suppose that would be a better. A solution if you're going to try to feed that to keep your bees going. Mary Springer made it. There's eight frame super full above. So backyard bees, you're good to go. If that thing's full, that's I'll bet they make it. But if they die out, I did not say that in the spring. So keep us posted. 29, hello to all. I'll be in Flo's neck of the woods in early February. John will. Do they, have you actually physically gone to their place? That would be interesting. I wonder if they give tours and stuff. I'm always curious when people show up and, and uh, Flow Hive has their own YouTube channel and people uh, are always visiting and getting interviewed and stuff. I wonder if they get invited and if they pay for them to come out there, if they just kind of showed up and said, hey, I'm in the neighborhood, do you want to talk to me? So I've never been invited to the Flow Hive uh, complex where they have all their bees. Uh, Larry Lee, you just, I froze up. Is my video degrading right now? If it is, we're going to shut this down. 
And uh, can you use store-bought honey as a backup feeding or just their own? Jennifer Calderon, I would not use store-bought honey in my beehives, period. Do you know that one of the most recent market research groups found that over 80% of store-bought honey is not real honey? We are doing a terrible job of policing the honey that is going in. Now, that's different from like your Whole Foods co-ops and places like that where they have a sticker and they validate the exact source and everything else. And there's pollen in it and everything else. But when when it comes to when it comes to the honey that's in your supermarkets and stuff, the bulk of it is not real honey, and that's a shame. I would not be feeding that stuff to my bees. But is it you know worse than sugar water? It's probably got some high fructose corn syrup and other things. They're doing such a good job of imitating honey. The honey pirates. Or just, uh, I don't even know what to say. Watch a documentary called Food Incorporated and see what's going on. And so here we go. Okay, Larry, thank you. I'm good now. In Maryland, had bees in both boxes before closing up for winter. Do I ever need to go back down to the brood box after year one? Well, once if... If you verify that they've got feed on and everything during winter, so if you've got uh, plenty of honey, you know, capped honey that the bees did and everything else, and your cluster is down below, there's no reason in the middle of winter to go down and inspect the brood box because guess what? You're not going to do anything for them. So more harm is done by beekeepers, particularly new beekeepers, who get a warm day in the middle of winter and decide they want to get down inside and check out all the details on their bees leave them closed up, verify they have food and resources, and then leave them alone and close it up as fast as you can. Uh, your potential is only to do harm to them. You can't requeen in the middle of winter. You're not gonna split the colony. There's nothing you're gonna do to resuscitate the colony beyond making sure they're sheltered, that they're sealed up well, and that uh, they have food and resources available so that when the cluster breaks, they have something to eat to keep them going. But don't get all the way down in those brood chambers. There's no practical reason for doing that. More people have killed their bees that way than not. Is Robert, it sucks here in Montana. I can only get natural honey, but I really love orange blossom honey and can't get it here except at the store. And it's, I believe, fake. Here's what you do, Robert. When you get a, I used to go to big box stores that I will not name because they come after you. Even the little people, they come after you. I took honey off the shelf. I get all the information off the back, where it came from, where it was being processed. And what I found was just a big processing center in the United States that does not produce honey. They didn't have any contracts to buy honey from honey producers here in the US. And uh, then I did the back check on that and found out it's not real. Companies, countries that have been banned from selling their honey to the United States, sell their honey to the United States still through shell companies. And then they go through other countries that we have trade agreements with and they get their honey here into the United States. Do a deep dive on Google, look up real honey, raw honey that isn't, and see what you come up with. I'll tell you what, it's a mess. Sorry, I meant, uh, do I ever need to condense back down to one box? No, if you're already in winter right now, our Philly, uh, leave your boxes as they're configured right now, because guess what happens when you pull your beehives apart in winter? It's too cold for them to work the propolis and wax. They can't reseal all of that great work that they did while it was still warm. So try not to break those valuable seals between the boxes, the inner cover to the top and everything else. They've propolized that. They've sealed that with some burr comb and everything else. And they have winterized themselves. When you pull that apart, they can't repair it anymore because it's too cold for them to work the wax and get it back. So try to stay out. You only want to verify. Don't condense anything. Don't change your configuration. In my opinion, now that winter has started, they're going to do the best they can. No tours, says John. I already connected and have to visit a neighbor with Flow Hives. Okay, so they don't give tours at the Flow. You know what? The Flow Hive people should actually have a visitor's bee yard and a visitor center where people can go and learn about the invention. It's fantastic, you would think. You know, they're in New South Wales. I would love to go to New South Wales because there are a lot of reptiles and amphibians for starters that I wanna check out there. If I ever go, you're gonna see some YouTubes about stuff that, I've also heard that the koala bears, uh, their habitat is impacted by the big fires that they've had in Australia this year. So uh, 
<clears throat> Robert says, yeah, Fred, I've seen a lot of documentaries on it. It's unbelievable what they get away with selling. Yeah, that's right. It is unbelievable. We need more. We need, we need more informed consumers to reject fake honey, but they're only buying it as a sugar. So they're not as informed or concerned about getting raw honey or the properties of honey that comes from a local beekeeper. And that's what I always tell people, get it from the Whole Foods Co-op, uh, get it from local beekeeper sources where you know who's raising the bees and you know that's real honey. And uh, you know that if it's chunk honey in the comb, that at least that's real honey. Is that real comb? You never know anymore on that either. Ronald Carter, this is what I try to tell people for years. Store honey, it's not real honey. You're right, Ronald, because the new reports that are out are dismal. <clears throat> Mary Springer, wow, didn't know that. I bought Publix Orange and it was really good, although my Publix may buy local. That's true. If they, if they source it locally, there's going to be a big sticker right on the shelf touting that. But if you go into, again, another big chain store that I went to, they had raw honey, a pint of raw honey for $3.50 not even close uh here we go is there an a, an approximate day or temperature that we say is the last time we can open the hive well i will say this and that's from bullet 68 uh the last day in your region first of all when you alter the feed if you're offering sugar syrup at the end of the year which should be two to one sugar to water uh, the, the first time to stop doing that is when you start getting freezing temps at night. And then, of course, because you can have a, a rare freezing day, but that's when you stop feeding the liquid because the bees are going to be trapped inside. This is another reason why I don't like it when people want to warm up their hives. You warm up their hives and the bees are consuming resources in there. And now they need to fly out to do a cleansing flight because just like you drinking a bunch of coffee, eventually you're going to need access to the bathroom. And uh, when they fly out, it's 29 degrees outside and they die in the snow. So heating the hive is a mistake. You want to keep their metabolism low and you want to keep them consuming things at a minimal rate because we don't want them to have to defecate. So here we go. And uh, there's somebody I'm going to have to block here. So we're going to... I'm going to classify that as hate speech. That's the first time that's ever happened. Now I'm actually going to have to um, hide the user. That's unfortunate. That's the first time that's happened. YouTube has a built-in filter system. It's supposed to block something like that. But uh, anyway... You're blocked and reported and uh, deleted. So we'll go. Mark Sipes, I've watched a channel about their teeny stingless bees kept in hives. The size of a child's shoebox. They're fascinating. Oh, yeah, I've seen those too. Stingless bees. Now, remember, people, this is basic backyard beekeeping. And uh, if you have questions about that, it would be great to talk about. Jim Miller. Spring going to be here before you know it. When should I treat for mites? You treat for mites, depending on what your treatment is. But uh, as soon as the weather breaks in spring and they're foraging, uh, you want to get a mite count. So you want to get into your brood frames and get some bees and see what the mite counts are. And if you require treatment, you want to do that before the main nectar flow comes on. Because a lot of treatments you cannot do when you're going to use the honey that they gather during the nectar flow. So in the spring, you treat before the nectar flow kicks in really strong. And in the fall, you treat after the nectar flow is done and after you've taken off the honey that you're going to use. So here we go. Fred asks, how long is a bee's memory? That's a really good question. Because uh, remember that bees have instinctive behaviors, but they also do demonstrate a certain level of memory. And I think Fred S. is asking this because he also asked a question about uh, if you lock up your bees for three days, do they forget where they live? And therefore, can you now move a hive to a new location and then the bees will come back out? I don't want to lock my bees up for three days, but uh, bees have recognition, visual recognition, and they can remember obviously where they've been because they return to the same location time and again. 
And uh, they also do that by scent, by sight. And so how long is their memory? I haven't personally done any tests for that, but I'll tell you this. I have walked out in the bee yard before with a test tube full of sugar water. And I've collected bees off of the landing board of a hive because as soon as they find the sugar water, they get on it. Then I walk away with that and then I sit down in my chair and I wait for them to finish drinking and then they fly back to the hive. And then they'll bring their friends, of course, and now you'll have 10 bees go into the test tube and they'll get that sugar syrup and then they fly back to the hive. Now, they're remembering the location because I'm static, I'm sitting in one spot. But what if I get up and walk and move to another location and I'm dressed the same and I still have the test tube? They go to the spot where I was, but they also seek me out and they'll visually go right to the level that I was holding that sugar water, which has no real aroma for them to follow. So they remember what I looked like and they come to me again. But as far as how long they will remember that, like you mentioned three days that they've um, remembered bees have a memory that's three days long. Uh, I don't know if that's true because we've had situations here where the bees go, for example, to a feeding station and then you get a week long of rain and uh, stormy weather and the bees are trapped inside and they can't navigate. But at the end of that week, when the weather breaks, they zip right back to that feeding station. So they remember the location of the feeding station for a week. So where the three-day memory comes in, I don't know, but it's a very interesting area. What is a bee's memory? How long will they register where a food resource is and things like that? That's very interesting. Carol Bee Farm, Fred, you need some moderators. Yes, I do. I do need a moderator. I don't know how you do that, but it would be fun because then I could have somebody feed me questions too. Hey, Fred, those stainless bees I've seen in videos, you guys doing hives on them. How do they... Oh, stingless bees. Uh, again, I don't work with stingless bees. I work with Apis mellifera. I don't have any experience with any of the stingless bees. There are many more viruses than just foul brood. There are also two types of foul brood, European foul brood and American foul brood. American foul brood is the worst. And uh, yes, he's right. And Lenore is correct. So moderator's good idea. How high can bees fly? So that's another question. How high does a bee fly? I don't know. Uh, on a practical level, uh, those who have studied drone congregation areas, I know that those are as high as 50 feet. And uh, look at Thomas Seeley's studies and some of the others who've studied drone congregation areas to see how high they fly. And they also put a queen in a cage and they put her uh, suspended underneath a balloon, a helium balloon, and they let that go to see at what height they would attract the drones. And uh, those are good tests and a good area to look into. On a practical level for a backyard beekeeper, uh, how high a bee flies isn't, you know, isn't really relevant on a practical level. We know they fly to the treetops and we know that they can orient themselves. So if they get the height, they can see the landscape, register the landscape and then travel. I think uh, it's to their benefit sometimes to fly high, but remember when they fly high, they're also susceptible to predation by birds because uh, in they're more they're in the open and they're distinguished and easy to get to. So but that's a curious question. I want to write it down. How how do bees fly? If anybody has a reference for that, uh, studies that have been done, for those who just want to know information for the sake of it, uh, Harold Bee Farm, I'll volunteer to be the mod moderator. And I think uh, somebody else, Carlos, who's not here today, volunteered to moderate some time. Hey, Fred, do honeybees utilize pine tree pollen? Uh, honeybees utilize pollen from a lot of different tree sources, but pine tree pollen is not at the top of the list. What they do get from pine trees um, is the rosin, resin, that then they use for propolis. So that's one thing that they get. But... Uh, for the pollen, as far as a meaningful source, uh, they go more after the aspens and uh, cottonwoods and things like that early in the year. And then of course the maples and oaks and things like that. As far as the pine tree pollen itself, I don't know that they're nuts about it. Um, it's not high on the list of beneficial pollens for bees, but uh, they do use the, uh, the resin that they get from the early blossoms. 
And then let's see. So he says, I have not seen a single bee in Seattle in over five years. Is there anyone else in the Seattle area? Are they having problems with honeybees? What do you think about the 5G network killing the bees? A lot of media is uh, talking about that. Well, that's from Harold Bee Farm. What do I think about the 5G network hurting the bees? I think that uh, all the way back to the cell phone myth that was put out earlier where they said cell phones were messing up the bees. Did you know that originated from a college student that was part of an apiary study who put a cell phone in a beehive and was trying to find out if the bees would be bothered by the cell phone? That got reinterpreted as uh, he was using the cell phone signal, which was not the case. It was the vibration of the phone. And they wanted to see if the bees would react to it, reject it, act differently around it. It was a total fail. Nothing happened. Uh, the bees might try to put propolis on it because they can't get rid of it and it's a foreign object in the hive. But uh, there was no evidence that they were reacting to any radio frequencies at all, low level or otherwise, electromagnetic frequencies. Uh, if you want to see what the bees think of those things, um, look at even wasps, for example, that like to build nests often on those high power stations. So there's no real evidence right now that I know of. If you know of a study that's real, not anecdotal information, but if you know of one that's real, uh, there's nothing that I've seen, read, or ever spoken with uh, anyone of any expertise that says that radio frequencies the 5G network or anything else uh, would have a detrimental impact on the honeybees. I think they would hurt people first. But uh, so anyway, Google says they can fly as high as a mountain. Okay, now see, as high as a mountain. What mountain? What's a mountain? Anyway, they could follow a mountain. They could fly up into the mountains. That's the other thing, altitude. Altitude, thin air, and so on might have an impact on the bees. So again, that's an area... I don't know uh, anything else about it. What about uh, Melaleuca and Florida Holly? Jeremy just walked down to the apiary and the bees are flying in and out. Such a beautiful thing to see. What's your temperature there, Jeremy Lindsay? Bees flying in and out. That's good that they can get out because those winter cleansing flights are important. Don't forget to keep your beehives clear. And I was over at uh, the adult toy store known as Home Depot. And I found these. This was in the grill section. And these are kebab skewers, but look how they're shaped. They have these little paddles on them. And then they're skewers for your barbecue. But guess what this is really for, in my opinion? This is for cleaning out your dead bees from your entrance reducers. So look at these flat. These things are perfectly designed. They go in there and scoop them out. So this beats out my paint sticks. I just got these because I was looking at stuff at random. Just to see what's going on. So the Weber Girl Company sells these. You want to get your bees out, get those. They're made out of bamboo. You talk about a tree a while back that was really good for bees. What was the name of that tree, and will it grow in North Florida? The tree that I'm talking about is the American Linden tree. The American Linden tree, if you get that thing to its adult size, its fully mature size, uh, that is a nectar-flowing giant. And uh, I'm not sure, I don't see why it wouldn't be able to grow in Florida, but look up the American linden. There's also the little leaf linden. I have three varieties of linden trees on my property. And uh, if you're going to grow a tree for bees, that's it. People don't like it, by the way, next to their driveways and things like that, because that linden tree is going to drop sap on your cars and things like that. That's the only unpopular aspect about it. But if you call it a bee tree, people won't want it around. But if you call it a pollinator tree, People are more than open to that because now they're thinking butterflies and stuff. So that's the tree, Robert. It's the linden. Mark Sipes, there again. Thank you, Mark. This is a super chat. Mark clicked the little dollar sign down there and it's given me a pizza. So after I do my baby portrait session this afternoon, Mark, we're going to get a pizza from you. So how is the OAV treatment actually killing the mites? Cause of death. Will you treat your observation hive and will you video it if and when you do? It would be interesting to see what they do with any residue. Okay, Mark, uh, I actually did treat the observation hive with oxalic acid vaporization and I made a video of it to show what the bee's reaction is. So I will try to put a link uh, to that down in the description. 
OAV treatment, observation hive. And uh, how does it kill the mites? The mites walk on it because the oxalis, the, it crystallizes and lands on all the surfaces, including we want to get it on as many bees as we can. The mites touch it with their feet. It goes through their feet and affects the nervous system of the mite and kills it without killing the bees. That's how it works. Although there's a lot of speculation about uh, what other things might be killing off the mites, but it works. I was impressed. And guess what? Aside from the initial puff of that oxalis, the sublimate, sublimated oxalis that goes into the hive, the bees rush away from it right away. And then they fanned it throughout the observation hive, which is why it was really a great opportunity to show that because you can see everything inside. The bees went back into their normal routine and normal behavior patterns, even while the oxalic acid vapor was moving freely through the observation hive. So it was very uh, beneficial to be able to see that the bees are not even stressed by the introduction of oxalic acid vaporization treatments. So that's why uh, OAV is the only thing I use. It's considered a soft treatment. It's naturally occurring. And uh, I use that and it works great. Thanks for that question. And there is a video showing exactly how to do it and what the bees do when they're exposed to it. Uh, JP says it causes suffocation. Mm, it really doesn't. It, uh, it gets through their feet. It gets into their nervous system. And it can damage their sensitive feet too, so they can't crawl on things anymore. But it's not suffocating them. It doesn't do anything to alter... Um, it's not like taking oxygen out where if you use CO2 or something, but it does damage their feet uh, to where they can't crawl around and they can't get on everything. Uh, so then backyard bees in North Carolina says burns their legs off. <laughs> well, I'm going to leave that as an open subject. Uh, Fred, is it wrong for me to clean out all the dead bees on the bottom or do you, or just do you and only open the front? If uh, if you can sweep out those bees from your bottom board during winter without opening the hive, I would not remove the brood box to do that. But if you've got a method for reaching in there and raking them out, the more dead bees that you get out, the less dead bees they're going to have to pull out. Also, those bees increase humidity and uh, they decompose in the bottom of the hive. So they actually start to stink. So the more that you can scrape out of there, the better. I'm actually looking for a tool. Nobody has this yet. So if you're some kind of innovator, and you're looking for a tool that you can make for beekeepers that would be beneficial. If you made something like this that was out of stainless steel, for example, and then it had a little articulated joint right here, and this part could bend, and this were curved, let's say. And then so you could push it in there and then push a plunger or something, and then cause this to bend over so that when you pulled it out, you're dragging it out, and then when you release it, it goes straight again. So you stick it in there, push a plunger, it sweeps over, and then you draw them out. It would be a fantastic thing, and it does not exist right now. So there's a tool present for me to use, something that we definitely could be uh, innovating, developing, and doing something with. But uh, yeah, clean them all out all you can without anything you can do without opening the hive that uh, improves your bees in winter and gets the stuff out of the way. Anything that's going to impede their progress or cause them extra work and you can do it for them, go ahead. Jeremy Lindsay, I planted two little leaf linden trees on my property here in Dandridge, Tennessee, for your advice some time back. So how are they doing? The problem with the linden trees is they just take so long to mature. So you're ahead. A friend of mine bought 10-foot linden trees. I think about one 10-foot linden trees, and the other two were four-foot. And they're going to take a long time until they get big enough to really get going. Uh, here's a uh, Linus says he used a quarter inch rod bent on the end about one or two inches. Yeah, if it's already bent and holding that position, we could do that. But the, the advantage would be if it goes in straight and then bends and then you can pull it out. You know, they have all these little grabbing tools and everything. That's what I would like to get a hold of. If there was one in existence now, I would get it. So right now I just do the chopstick move. But if it's already bent, and you stick it in there, you know, you're kind of pushing bees back to pull bees forward. Less effective, although it probably would still work. Just uh, I'm looking for a new tool there. So anybody else have questions? Uh, what else do we have here? What's your input with Brazilian sour honey? 
that's from Nate. What is your input with Brazilian sour honey? I don't have any input because I have zero experience with it. Um, and then JP the Bee Man in Delaware says, OAB does stress the bees a bit. Watch my video and see what they do. The initial reaction is they want to get away from it afterwards. I mean, seeing is believing. So how did you determine that they were stressed? The stress comes from the fact that you have to close up the hive to do it. So when you shut down the landing board and uh, then you put the OAV in there, there's a source of stress because they can't come and go as they want and they can't ventilate the way they normally would. So you're going to be closing it up for six to 10 minutes. That would be a source of stress. But as far as the exhalus itself causing the stress, I don't know. But I, my mind is open on that. And I'd be interested in knowing how you determine their stress level. And uh, what else next? How come your forehead is so bright? Okay, so there's another one. I do need a moderator. <laughs> What's the matter with people today? Oh, it was already hidden. Thank goodness. <clears throat> So that's an example of uh, of the uh, automatic algorithm blocking people. So then what to say? I guess something's in the air today. It's people just want to be angry. What are some of the best flowers for the Midwest area for beekeepers? Well, I'll tell you what, For and don't look at just for bees. Look at it for pollinators in general. But throughout the Midwest, what we need the most milkweeds. So we planted swamp milkweeds. There are a bunch of different milkweed varieties out there. And uh, the other thing is we can uh, get, uh, you know, there's something that I did this year that led me to find some new flowers that the bees were really going to go after. I went to a local garden center, which has acres of uh, plants that they're selling. And we go at different times of the year and see what bees are on what. So right in the garden center, that led me to a couple of plant uh, decisions that I bought this year uh, just because the bees were all over them at the garden center. So you can cheat. You go there and see what they're doing at different times of year. And of course, you know, you start in the spring with dandelions and clover and of course the trees and then uh, it progresses. But we planted wildflowers. Sunflowers are a major deal right now for the pollen resource. So they're throughout the Midwest, they grow everywhere and we get those uh, from Eden Brothers. So go and check out those mixes. And I like perennials that come up all the time. I don't like to replant every year. So, and then of course, rounding things out with the uh, Maximilian sunflowers, which are just loaded with nectar. So those are my top picks. It would be the uh, clover, alfalfa, if you can get that going, if you've got big fields and of course sunflowers and uh, so on. So, but don't ignore trees. So Jeremy, 50 degrees here, by the way, I found a few dead bees on the landing board. There's always a few dead bees, that's signs of activity. If you walk past a hive and there's a warm up and there's snow in front of it, and there's, it's not peppered with a few dead bees, then uh, either they're very good winterers or they might actually be dead. So that's interesting. And uh, you know what? I think we're almost going to wrap this up. Wait, here's Robert. It seems like they really love maple tree sap at certain times of the year. The wasps in the bees, you can hear them. They're so thick on the maple trees. Uh, well, maples actually have early season flowers, so that's an early source for them. So they definitely get pollen, and, and they do like to get their sap from that. But the people that have evaluated the resin that the bees have brought in and identified the sources there are lists of the top resin choices for the bees for propolis, for example. So see, is it happening towards the fall? Now that's interesting because in fall, my bees are really working on other things because we still have the wildflowers that are providing. So um, that's, uh, I don't pay that much attention to the trees in fall because they're in decline and they're not flowering. So that's kind of interesting. And uh, Nate says, uh, have a good day. Same to you. Going to go play with Stinger. <laughs> okay. But uh, I guess we may wrap this up unless somebody else has a question that's uh, burning right now. You want to know? Uh, we could answer that. Otherwise, we'll just wrap it up. And let me know if you thought this was even helpful. 
Mark Sipes, the Maximilian Sunflower seems seeds linked me to someone besides Eden Brothers. Are they who you get the seeds from? I get my Maximilian Sunflower seeds from Eden Brothers. I also get my, uh, not just the Maximilians, but I get the big sunflower seed mixes. And those were fantastic. Dansky. Okay, I have something to say about Dansky. Because <laughs> I was going to do a coffee cup giveaway based on my winter uh, walk through the woods that I posted yesterday. I was going to offer a free coffee cup to the first person who could spot the game camera on the tree in that video. And here goes Dan writing a comment in there. Saw the game camera and you killed my you killed my fun, Dan. Go check out Dansky Dansky's bees, by the way. He's got a really good vlog. And uh, he says, dang it, wrong time zone. But thanks, Dan. You blew it for everybody. Somebody could add a coffee cup for free. One of these. But now it's now it's not going to happen. But there's a game camera in that video. It was supposed to be kind of a can you spot the game camera thing. He's too keen. He spots things right away. Is it just me or have we lost Fred? What? Did I go away? Is it cutting out? And uh, when painting a new hive, are there paints or sealers not to use? When you're painting the outside of your beehive, uh, an exterior quality, good quality house paint is all you need to do. Your bees are not going to eat the paint. What you put on the inside of the hive is far more important than what you put on the outside of the hive. So uh, water-based latex house paints are fantastic for the exterior. Sometimes if it's really good quality wood, I like to use uh, marine quality spar varnish, the same finish that they were using on uh, the Blue Nose schooner, the one that just came here, the Blue Nose 2. Uh, so what they were using on their woodwork uh, is what I like to put on the bees too. Yeah, Dan's trying to apologize for everybody, but I don't know, Dan, you're gonna have to recover. You're gonna have to offer somebody a free coffee cup. Larry Lee, thanks for the great live chat, Fred. Have a great day. Same to you, Larry. Mark Sipes, what about those willows? Are they in seed or do you need saplings? Uh, when it comes to willows, you can cut the willows and propagate those on your own because they grow so fast. But the willows are a great early pollen source. Pussy willow trees, I planted an entire hedge next to the apiary on the west side, and uh, the bees are getting pollen out of those in February. So that's a very good choice for early resources. And how well of a pollinator are oak trees? I have about 60 huge oak trees. Again, in the early spring, these trees are good. Uh, so as far as for you know the pollen for the bees, you're gonna have to I'm gonna have to post a list of top pollen trees down in the video description so you'll be able to see that. Okay, it'll be my first time keeping bees. I bought a box of Saskatrass bees. What to expect? Do they need different or special attention compared to other bees? They do not need any. This is from Charles Thompson. Uh, Saskatrass bees do not require any different management than any of the other bees. They are not true uh, survivor bees in that they cannot, based on my experience this year, they can't hold their own with uh, Varroa. So you may have to do a Varroa treatment on them. Uh, but other than that, those things are fantastic in every possible way. And uh, this is my first winter with them. So in the spring, um, in the spring, they will hopefully be strong and I'll be able to give a positive report. It looks like my feed is cutting out, so I can't tell if this is working or not. We're going to go ahead probably and uh, close the chat if I'm not coming through clear. If someone can see me clear, let me know. If not, we're going to get out of here. Thank you for your time. Have a good Sunday. I wish you all a very good Sunday, too, and that you can take care of your bees. Again, look for some of these follow-up uh, information links that we're going to put down below. And uh, please go ahead and continue your conversations down in the comment section of this video and uh, see where that goes. Post links. Those of you who brought up some information about the height that bees fly and things like that, if you know something about this 5G network and how it's supposed to impact bees. And if that's from a real source, not something flying around on, on Facebook that just tries to get everybody scared. Stephanie, uh, put those links down. I, I welcome people putting links even to your own videos, your own websites. That's great. Dan Ski, check him out. He's got some good videos. Uh, last question. I have three hives. Gave them all sugar mountain camp. Only one hive is eating it. 
could that hive be low on resources? Okay, yeah, they uh, eat what you give them when they need it. So the one that's ignoring it definitely probably has their own resources, but the ones that are consuming that, uh, it is a sign that they're not satisfied with the resources that they have, although not every colony behaves the same. So if you know for yourself that that colony has resources before you put on that uh, sugar source, then they're probably good to go. Hives side by side, some take a resource, some don't. And all of my hives are loaded with their own capped honey. So it's kind of hot luck. Uh, on what they take. So what you know about the resources on the hive are more important, but they will abandon the resources, artificial resources that you put in once real nectar flows start in the spring. But as far as winter goes, when they have stored honey and capped honey and things like that, um, they are apt to sometimes go after a new resource, even though they have other resources fully stored up. So they tend to use things on a whim in the winter time, but in the spring, they would definitely ignore the artificial stuff for that natural stuff that they're finding in the environment. What's the best vegetables in our fruits that can be planted around a beehive for a small garden? If you're trying to help the bees get nectar and pollen resources, vegetables and fruits are not uh, bringing in that much for the bees. Uh, for example, when it comes to tomato plants, the honeybees can't even pollinate the tomatoes. Did you know that? The bumblebees have to, um, buzz pollinate the tomato flowers. So there are some things that uh, if fruits and vegetables benefit us and the bees will pollinate them, but what the bees get out of there, that's not a, a solid nectar flow for the bees, but it is a symbiotic thing. You can provide, you know, pollen and nectar resources and get vegetables at the same time. But uh, it's a good thing to think about all the bees. So so Fred, would it be okay if my wife contacted you sometime? She loves her chicken and she has lots of questions about them. And I know this isn't really the place for those questions. You know what we need to do? Robert, we need to do a live chat just for chicken people because I have ignored my chicken people for a long time. And uh, I think we probably need to do a live chat just for backyard chickens and poultry. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a certified poultry technician for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and have a long history with chickens, guineas, ducks, and everything else. So we'll be glad to talk about that sometime. I think we're going to wrap it up. And thank you so much for being here. Sorry we had kind of a slow start. And I apologize if any of the rude people's comments actually showed up in the feed and that you had to read that and know that they exist. Who knows why they do what they do. But we're going to end the stream. And uh, we have to wrap it up. Let me, all right, so I'm designing a long bank straw time planning. I'm putting in some flow frames. Would you recommend putting them in the middle or near the back of the box? Before you put your flow frames on the long length straw box, find out, because once you start your brood frames and everything, they have a tendency to start building honey out to one side and not the other. So you need to find out what direction they're going with their honey frames, and that's the lineup where you want to put in your flow frames so they'll use it, because if it goes on the other side, they might ignore it. So wait until they start storing honey in what direction they're favoring. Put your flow hives in that line so they will use that. And thank you everyone again for being here. And if you have questions I did not get to, please write them down in the comments section and uh, we'll try to get to them later on and maybe in next Friday's question and answer video. Thanks again for your support and for being here. Have a great weekend.